Welcome back, guys. Um, I'm super excited about the topic of today's lecture because we're finally going to be talking about classical genetics in this um, lecture today. So up till now, we've been kind of setting the stage and talking about background information that we needed to know in order to really go deep into genetics. So now we are going to be talking about genetics and specifically um, we are going to start by looking at some classical genetics, Mendelian genetics, that is another name for it, by examining genetic analysis of single genes. Now, Mendelian genetics goes way more deep and more involved than just single genes. It does look into multiple genes as well, but we're going to start off uh, with single gene analysis. So for today's lecture, um, we are going to be focusing on Chapter 3 in Nicole and Barrett's Online Open Genetics and Chapter 1 in the second Open Genetics textbooks. So our goals today, here are the, here's basically an outline of today's lecture. We're going to start talking about classical genetics and Mendelian genetics. Um, we will talk about Mendel's first law specifically today. Uh, for much of the lecture, um, we are going to uh, review relationship between genes, genotypes, and phenotypes. We're going to talk about what makes a gene uh, dominant or recessive. Um, and then we will be focusing on crossing techniques used in classical genetics that have helped us understand how single genes um, are inherited and how different phenotypes are seen at the end of the day in response to the way um, the genes are um, given to the progeny. So with that, we are also going to be touching um, a little bit on sex linkage towards the end of our lecture today when um, we talk about exceptions to Mendel's first law. Um, and finally, we're going to finish off by looking at instances where your phenotypes or the, what is visible to you in an organism may not be as expected um, based on genotype alone. Okay, so um, Mendel uh, is somebody that you've heard about before, I'm sure, in many different classes of viewers. He is known as the father of modern genetics or classical genetics. Now, Greider Mendel was a monk, but uh, he was of German speaking Czech origin. Um, but he was more than just that, right? He was a very um, learned man, and he also was very interested in doing, learning more about scientific fields of various types. He was a meteorologist, he was a mathematician, um, as well as a biologist. And it is his work with um, different characteristics of peas uh, and very careful monitoring of individual, his, you know, attention to detail in designing his experiments and conducting his experiments his extreme care in collecting data for each one of his experiments is what allowed him to um, learn as much as he did to develop the theories or develop the laws that he did of classical genetics. And he was, you know, like, so he wasn't doing anything different than what was already being done by farmers all across the world. So they many farmers for centuries had been cross-breeding different um, species as well as different phenotypes um, in the, an organism to get the traits they wanted in that organism, right? So they had both animal and plants being bred according to desirable traits to make them be what they are um, or what they wanted them to be. So it wasn't as such a brand new concept. However, his experiments that he performed um, did allow um, the proof behind it. They allowed us uh, to gain the understanding on why it is that that could be done. 
So his experiments, the biggest thing about them is that he was extremely careful uh, in the design as well as um, data collection and monitoring of um, the experimental result at every step. And that's the biggest thing with him. So through his experiments, he recognized that individual traits could exist in different flavors or different versions, which is what we know now as alleles um, within an animal or a plant, and that these different versions of that trait can um, be passed on to progeny and that when that happens, they are passed down in a very particular way. So um, he was able to uh, show that alleles that are associated with different traits typically remain indivisible and they are inherited kind of separately from each other. So it's not that blue hair will always have blonde, um, you know, blue eyes will always end up with blonde hair or brown eyes will always end up with brown hair. It could be a mix of the two as well. So Mendel's first law, it talks about the law of equal segregation. And it is basically that when gametes form during sex, sexual reproduction, the two alleles, the one from your mom and the one from your dad, the two different flavors or variants that you've gotten, at a particular gene locus are going to segregate from each other. They will separate and that each gamete, each resulting gamete, each resulting daughter cell will have equal chance, equal probability of getting either one of them in a typical diploid organism. So um, this was basically his first law, which is the law of equal segregation, that in a diploid organism, when you have two uh, alleles, one from your mom and one from your dad, the daughter cells or the gametes uh, in, have equal chance of getting one or the other. And you can see that kind of played out over here, drawn out over here, where in meiosis you have, um, in that first set, you have the two um, homologous chromosomes separating, and then and you get your individual daughter cells. Each daughter cell is going to have one or the other allele and not both at any given time. And there are equal chance that you can get the one from your dad versus the one from your mom. So Mendel uh, found these laws uh, after experimentation using seven very specific traits in pea plants. These included, um, he chose very carefully these traits that he was going to follow. Um, and that kind of, you know, a little bit of luck and a, a lot of really careful observation went into this design. So this included um, observations regarding the seed in the shape of, in its shape or color, um, flower color itself. Uh, where the flowers were placed along the plant was another one that he looked at, thing he looked at. Also the size of the plant, whether they were short or tall. And then finally with the actual the peas themselves, the pods, they look, he looked at the shape of the pods and the color of the pods. So there are seven total traits that he was looking at through his experimentation um, individually first, as well as in combination. He started off by doing individual experiments with each of these traits, looking at lines that were pure breeding, which means that they were just giving that one trait um, as the answer. So only round seeds, only wrinkled seeds. He wasn't caring about anything else, just, you know, it could have different colors or different shapes of flowers or whatever. But as far as the seed was concerned, these he would choose plants that would always produce just round seeds or just sprinkled seeds. And that would be a pure breeding plant. He would cross them together and see what he was getting. 
um, in the progeny in that first uh, generation and then follow them through second generation. So before we start talking about that, let's look at different types of alleles, different type of variations you may see um, in a particular gene, and we are looking at that. So remember, you have your chromosomes. They are paired um, in diploids in a diploid organism with one of them coming from each parent. Sometimes both parents contain, uh, have the same exact variant, same exact type of that particular trait. So both have brown hair or blue eyes or whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, in that case, the alleles for that particular gene would be called homozygous because that particular gene has both copies exactly the same. They're both for whatever trait you were looking at, but they were both for the same variant of that trait. In a heterozygous organism or a, a heterozygous um, gene locus, you will have alleles of the genes that are different from each other. So you have one brown eye versus one blue eye allele or green eye allele. Um, so that is another possibility. And in this case, this will be called heterozygous. In a third possibility, you have um, something gone wrong with one of your alleles or one copy of the allele, maybe there was a mutation or a deletion, something that happened so that there is, or it, it was somehow silenced because of post-translational modifications. Um, and in this case, or epigenetic changes, that's another one. In this case, there's only one copy of the gene present in your geno uh, in your genome, and that would be a case when it is hemizygous. Now, genes on the Y chromosome are going to be hemizygous because the only time that you have them is if you have Y chromosome in the case of a boy and there's only one Y chromosome present and so all the genes that are going to be on that chromosome are going to be hemizygous. That's an example of uh, how you would get that. If you look at epigenetic terms where you still have two copies um, thinking about those bar bodies in uh, uh, females where one of the X chromosome is automatically shut down, those genes would be hemizygous because they would only have one active copy available. So the particular place where a gene is present on a chromosome is called a locus. So when I say gene locus, I'm talking about a particular gene at its normal point and the different variants that you see of that particular gene locus of, the, of that particular gene um, are alleles that are gonna be responsible for the visible traits associated with that gene locus. Some other important terminology, which uh, will be a mixture of new and old. First of all, uh, knowing the difference between genotype and phenotype is gonna be extremely important in the coming you know, the rest of the semester, essentially. Genotype refers to just differences in the DNA sequence itself that may be found in the population related to a particular gene locus. Now, these differences in DNA sequences may or may not lead to differences in the visible uh, look of that trait. So a difference in a gene uh, locus at a particular amino acid or a particular, you know, um, nucleic acid sequence, right? So just a change from an A to a T or a C or a G or maybe something else may or may not result in, the, in a different visible trait, right? Um, so the differences in the DNA sequences is what is called, termed, or called, Genotype. Phenotype, on the other hand, is what you observe, what you can physically see on the outside. So usually there are a lot more genotypes present for any given trait, for any given gene locus, than there are phenotypes, because there are multiple genotypes that can still lead to the same end point, same physical observable trait at the end of the day. Um, 
Wild type is usually the most common allelic form that you can see in a natural population. Now, wild type uh, doesn't have to be just one. There's sometimes there are multiple uh, variants that are present that are equally prominent in that population, and all of them can exist, coexist at the same type, and they can all act as wild type. But the most common allelic form in a natural population is typically termed the wild type uh, form of that particular gene locus. Variants are going to be all those little individual DNA sequences that you are seeing um, at the DNA level. Uh, but they may be indistinguishable in appearance uh, at the phenotypic level which means that they're going to be a lot more variants of a gene available again than phenotypes available. So you may only have four different flavors or four different colors of eye or hair, but you will have hundreds of variants sometimes that can lead to those few phenotypes. Mutants are going to be alleles that change the DNA sequence in a way that the appearance changes or the final function changes and becomes different than the wild type allele or wild type phenotype. Um, and so mutants are going to be basically something, variants, again, there are DNA sequences that are changed, but this time they're not leading to the same phenotype as before as a wild type individual, but rather different appearance. And then finally, allelic series are uh, is basically all the mutant alleles of a gene and all the ranges of phenotypes that are seen in a population related to a particular gene locus. Um, so different mutant alleles of a gene that are causing all those different phenotypes are going to be all part of the same allelic series. So here are some human inherited um, mutations as well as variants that are available in our uh, populations. These are the common one. Uh, and again, different alleles are going to have different um, probability in some ways, right? So you'll have always a dominant gene allele that is our dominant trait that's going to be pr uh, passed on in a dominant fashion, where all you need is a single copy of that particular allele, and it will show the trait associated with it, the flavor of the trait associated with it. On the other hand, um, if you have the recessive allele for a particular gene locus, you have to have just that. You cannot have anything else outside of that flavor of the gene locus, that particular variation of the gene locus, for that phenotype to show. So in a, a humans, cleft chin is a dominant um, trait or dominant gene, but a no cleft is a recessive gene. So for no cleft, um, you would need both alleles to be this for no cleft, for it to not have a cleft. If you have any allele, associated with a cleft, you will end up with a cleft chin. Same thing with widow's peak versus no widow's peak. Widow's peak is also a dominant trait. Dimples are dominant. Typically, um, darker pigments, um, darker hair color, darker eyes, like brown eyes, brown or black hair, those are going to be dominant alleles compared to blonde hair or gray blue eyes, which are lack of pigments or less pigments available. Okay, so let's look at how that uh, how we would examine some of these traits to figure out which one is dominant, which one is recessive. So to do that, we would do experiments very similar to what Mendel did. And so I'm going to use some of his uh, experiments as examples here to kind of walk you through this idea. Um, to examine these kind of traits, you want to have true breeding lines or true breeding individuals for that trait. 
They don't have to be true breeding for all traits, but just for the trait that you're un, uh, interested in studying. So um, true breeding are basically inbred populations of animals or plants, doesn't matter what it is, in which every single individual, both the parents and the offsprings for many, many, many generations will always give the same phenotype with respect to that one trait that you're interested in examining, the one gene locus that you're interested in looking at. Um, in this case, they're assumed to be homozygous for that particular allele um, related to the trait that you're looking at, that you're examining. And um, when you have that, uh, these populations, you have two different true breeding populations showing those two phenotypes, you then cross them together and examine the progeny for that one trait and how it shows up in the offsprings or in that first filial generation after the parents are crossed together. This is called a monohybrid cross, looking at examining just a single gene locus with the different alleles that are present there. So a monohybrid cross is a cross where both parents were homozygous. Um, original parental lines were homozygous, true breeding lines. Um, and now you are examining them, uh, crossing them, examining their first filial generation, um, and then crossing that first filial generation, which would now be heterozygous for the trait for a single mono one single trait and examining the second filial generation from there. So here is an example. In a true breeding line, you're crossing two individuals from the same, with the same phenotype, same, you know, probably genotype, so that every single generation leads to the same effect right? They always have purple flowers. They always have yellow seeds. They always have wrinkled seeds or round seeds. That's a true breeding line. In a monohybrid cross, you have parents that are true breeding for a particular allele, um, for a particular gene, showing two different variations of them, right? So one parent is true breeding for one uh, form of that trait and the second is true breeding for a different form of that same trait. So brown eyes were against blue eyes or green eyes, brown hair against blonde hair. That's a true, uh, those are two, two breeding individuals that are then crossed with each other in the first cross, in the parental cross. And the, you take your first filial generation that you get from there, you observe them, you look at which one shows up to be the dominant of the two alleles that you were examining, the two flavors of the gene that you were examining. And then you cross them again and examine the second filial generation to see how it pans out, how it plays out in the progeny there. So in this case, um, and this is would be called a monohybrid cross because you're examining a single trait. In this case, it was looking at flower color, purple versus white. So when we do this, we are going to find um, that different traits are passed on in a very different manner. Some are going to have very clear dominant versus recessive alleles. So one allele is going to be completely dominant, others not, and others are not going to show such clear results. So we're going to look at each one of those possibilities and examine how it pans out. So the first one is examining complete dominance. So in this case, I have um, three different possibilities for my phenotypes based on what I observed in my monohybrid cross. So when we were doing the monohybrid cross, I had purple homozygous dominant flowers and white, I didn't know which one was dominant yet, but purple flowers and I had some white flowers. So these are both true breeding lines. I cross them and when I, in my first filial generation, I get all purple flowers. 
that indicates that purple is dominant to the white flower. Um, so we would write the capital A's of, to denote that the parent had both alleles the same for purple. It could be capital P um, for each of the allele as well. And we're going to, for a dominant allele, we use capital letters and for a recessive allele we use lowercase letters so it's small a versus capital a and in that first generation because they're going to obviously get a copy from the mom and a copy from the dad or copy from one and copy from the other all the progeny is going to be heterozygous having one um dominant and one recessive allele and so this is showing 100% purple flowers. And then when you cross them with each other, you'll get some flowers that are going to be purple and some that are white. But the only time you're going to get white flowers is if they have both recessive alleles, so both lowercase alleles in this case. So now we have these three uh, possible genotypes. The homozygous, heterozygous, and uh, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and then homo, uh, homozygous recessive. And we are going to examine if they have complete dominance or if they have something different uh, in their pattern. So based on our monohybrid cross, we know that purple is dominant and white is recessive. Even if we didn't have that information just looking at this, because our heterozygous is showing purple as well, we know that purple is dominant to the white phenotype. Um, so we can show our results of the cross using a Punnett square. A Punnett square is basically a way to organize our progeny um, and our possible results examining um, the parental genotypes that we've got. So in this case, we had our two parental genotypes, the homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. Um, and we just kind of go across and we take one allele from each in each one of these boxes to make our progeny. So the first one is going to be one um, of the dominant allele, one of the recessive allele. So you get a heterozygous individual. Same thing for the second and same thing for the other two. So all four individuals actually have the same exact genotype. That means you are gonna have 100% heterozygous um, plants at the end of your first cross. Looking at the phenotype, the physical features, the actually what you see, because purple is dominant and white is recessive, all plants in this case are uh, going to produce purple flowers because that's the dominant color. And as long as there is one dominant allele present, you're going to get a purple flower. And that's what you see here. So you have 100% heterozygous individuals and 100% purple flowers producing plants. Um, so both genotype and phenotype are essentially 100% same. This is going to be your F1 for our uh, filial uh, generation, first filial generation. Now in F2, in the second filial generation, we're gonna go ahead and take these heterozygous plants and just let them mate or cross with each other and produce new plants. So let's look at this new cross now. In the second filial generation, you are gonna have heterozygous on both sides. So let's fill that out again. You're gonna go up and over, so capital A and capital A. You're gonna get a homozygous dominant plant that will produce purple flowers. Then both up here as well as down here, you're gonna have one dominant and one recessive allele. Same thing here, one dominant, one recessive allele. So you're gonna have heterozygous um, plants in this case, which because purple is dominant will also give you purple flowers. And finally, you're gonna have a homozygous recessive plant in this last box, and that's gonna be a white flower producing plant. So here is the phenotype of, associated with 
these genotypes after you did that uh, second filial cross. Um, we're looking at the ratios themselves. The ratios are going to be different now. In this case, they were all 100% um, heterozygous and 100% purple. But now your ratios are actually one to uh, one dominant to two heterozygous to one recessive. So one to two to one. Phenotypic ratio. And the phenotypic ratio, what you physically see, is going to be three purple flowers to one white. So three to one phenotypic ratio. In a complete dominant situation, that's the ratio that you expect to see in all cases. Now, just again, some genetic terminology to go ahead and get started with that. Dominant alleles, as I said, are going to be written with capital letters, and lowercase letters will be used for the recessive alleles. Sometimes, instead of um, using the capital letters and recessive letters, you may see people use superscripts and subscripts uh, as well to indicate alleles. Uh, so instead of just having it like that, you may have it as A with a little P or, you know, um, A with a big P or a little P to indicate dominant and recessive. And finally, for your wild type allele, the symbol can be just a plus. So if you have two wild type alleles, it will be plus backslash plus in that case. Okay, so let's say that you got a brand new plant and now you want, or a brand new organism that you work with, and now you want to know whether it is a pure breeding um, individual or plant or not. In this case, you would want to run what we call a test cross. In a test cross, you have an unknown um, organism or an unknown object plant that is showing the dominant phenotype. So it could be heterozygous or homozygous for the dominant allele. And you want to know which one it is. So you would cross it with a known homozygous recessive individual, and you would examine the progeny in that first filial generation. If you have a homozygous uh, individual in, uh, as your unknown, you will get 100% dominant response in the progeny because there will be 100% heterozygous. So you would get, in this case, 100% black sheep because black was dominant to white. If it is, in, uh, on the other hand, a heterozygous individual that was given to you, in that case, you would see 50% black and 50% white individuals. And here is that cross. So you have a homozygous, uh, known homozygous recessive, a true breeding recessive, and you have your own uh, unknown um, dominant, physically uh, visibly dominant uh, individual. If it was a heterozygous, it would be a big B, little b in this case. Um, so the little bees kind of went over because you get two homozygous recessive, which would be white, and two heterozygous dominant, so those will be black. And you'll get a one-to-one -one ratio. So a test crossed is a way that we can figure out an unknown individual that we have just acquired and ensure that it is in fact true breeding or the way we expect it to be. And that's how we used to determine and present the genotypes in the beginning. Uh, so not only can it help us determine which alleles are present in our particular genotype, but also help us decipher whether our individual is a dominant um, homozygous or heterozygous. Now, not all uh, alleles are going to be uh, acquired and passed on in a dominant, uh, just like complete dominant fashion. Sometimes you have traits that show incomplete dominance within the various flavors or variants of their alleles of that at that gene locus. Uh, so another color 
flower color can also be inherited in an incomplete dominant fashion because depending on the pigments that you're looking at, depending on the colors that you're working with or the plant that you're working in. This can also be called semi-dominant. Um, and this is where both alleles play a part when they come together in a heterozygous individual and create a brand new phenotype that was not visible in either one of the original parents. So here we have an example with red and white flowers. In this case, both red and white um, can show up together and create a new phenotype when you have a heterozygous plant. So when you have a homozygous for one, uh, for the red allele, in this case, it's denoted as that subscript, like I told you, um, and that it can be done. And that's typically used with incomplete dominance because multiple alleles can be dominant or can coexist at the same time at the same intensity. So they can be, they're both written with capital letters and shown the different flavors or alleles are shown as subscripts. So in this case, you have red individuals that are shown as ones and then white that are shown as two. And your heterozygous is neither red nor white, but instead a new phenotype in the shape of pink, which is shown as one allele as one and the other as two. Here's another way that it can be written as. Um, and this is flower color. Uh, so they are using F for flower color and then using red and white as subscript, uh, superscript to show um, the different pigments that are going to be present in or in the form of alleles in this particular plant. So this is using the red four o'clock as an example. R is your red, W is your white allele. Both of them are using capital letters because both can exist together in the same intensity um, and neither is dominant to the other. And so again, in that first generation, when you cross to pure breeding reds and whites together, you're gonna get 100% heterozygous plants and 100% of them are gonna be pink because they are all, they're going to show both and red and white pigments together. Um, and then in your second generation, when you allow these F1s to kind of cross pollinate and just um, cross within them, you would get that one to two to one ratio where one uh, fourth of the plants will be either white or red because they are homozygous for those alleles. And then when they are together, in a heterozygous manner, you're going to end up with pink plants. Finally, you can have co-dominance and multiple alleles uh, existing in a particular uh, trait as well. So co-dominance uh, co is basically when um, there are two dominant alleles, so kind of like red and white, um, and both of them are going to lead to a different essentially phenotype. So the biggest example of that that is used is human ABO blood type. So if you have group A blood, you have antibodies in plasma for against B, and you have antigens for A on your red blood cells. So that's going to be your um, blood type. When you have group B, you have the opposite. You have B antigens on your red blood cells and anti-A antibodies in the blood. Um, if you have a heterozygous individual that contains A and one allele of A and one allele of B, you will have neither antibodies in, pl uh, in the plasma and both antigens on your red blood cells. Um, and finally, you can have a stage, a condition where you have none of these flavors so you have neither a nor b um, antigens uh, on your blood um, and both anti-a and anti-b antibodies in your plasma so this is your kind of a very recessive phenotype in this case because that will only happen if there are no antigen presence none of those alleles are present 
but um, individually they can exist both as heterozygous or homozygous, right? So you can have one allele for A and one allele for O, and you'll still have blood type A because A exists. So A is going to be um, dominant to O, but A is going to be co-dominant with B because if you have A, one copy of A and one copy of B, then both of them can coexist in that same space. Right, so the heterozygous is going to express both A and B, and it will have both of them together. Another example of multiple alleles is a coat color in many animals. In this case, we are showing rabbit uh, as an example. So you can have a uh, you know, full color rabbits that are typically the wild type or a Guti form, you can, which is going to be dominant to an albino rabbit that has no pigment available on their uh, fur, and that's going to be your uh, lowercase c versus capital C. However, in full color, you can have different variants. You can have a light gray uh, or chinchilla allele where you have one copy of the full color, but another copy of the slight gray, uh, leading to a different color uh, phenotype. And you can see an example of full color would be dominant to both of these. So full color is gonna be when it is homozygous for full color, or when it is heterozygous for either light gray with light gray or albino alleles. You will still get an agouti rabbit. If you have a rabbit that's chinchilla, it's going to be containing only uh, the chinchilla uh, or light gray uh, allele or light gray allele in combination with the albino allele. So it can still be be heterozygous, but it is it is in this case chinchilla is recessive to full color but dominant to albino. And finally, you can have CH, which are uh, albino with black extremities or hemolyan in color. Now this one is also recessive to light gray, but it is um, dominant to albino. So albino is the pure recessive form of this particular color. Hemolyan is uh, and chinchilla are both going to be recessive to full color, but they're going to be um, dominant to albino, albino and chinchilla or light gray is going to be recessive to full color, but dominant to both hemolyan and albino. So different alleles can show both co-dominance as well as dominant recessive complete, dominant or recessive depending on what they are pairing with in a given environment. Okay, so what is basically the biochemical reason behind this dominance or recessive phenotype that you observe? The reason they happen is basic uh, is dependent upon what it is that you're coding for and where does it fall in the pathway. So um, the reason I'm using a lot of like color coding example is because it's kind of intuitive to think about. Uh, you either have a pigment or you don't, right? And if you have two pigments, then those two pigments can mix together and make a different pattern, and that makes sense. Um, so there are three ways that uh, you can line them up in a pathway to see how the response is going to be. One of them is haplosufficient. So for many wild type alleles or the dominant so-called alleles, even if you have loss of function mutation in one of the allele, as long as you have the other one present, it will compensate and provide that particular uh, activity so that you can get a normal phenotype. So an example of that is, again, those blood types. As long as I have one allele with the A antibody or, or you know, A antigen or the B antigen, 
that's all that I need to put something on my blood cells and those uh, to show up. Uh, same thing with pigment, right? As long as I have some pigment, that pigment's going to show. On the other hand, you have haploinsufficient alleles, where a single white top allele, while it produces some um, color or some protein or some activity, is just not enough to get the full normal phenotype. So in this case, it's going to be semi-functional or non-functional, depending on what it is um, that you are working with. And finally, sometimes the mutation happens in a way that now it no longer binds or responds to the same stimuli, but rather responds to completely different systems altogether. So maybe it doesn't bind to its normal binding partners and instead binds to a different protein that can lead to a very different response. Um, so these, in this case, these alleles may encode new products, new proteins that lead to different biochemical functions uh, leading to obviously a new phenotype in that case. So up till now, even though, you know, we've seen different alleles that are uh, acting together in dominant uh, manners or coexisting as dominant and alleles that combine, when combined, give you a completely different phenotype not, that neither one of the parents had, they were still following Mendelian uh, form and Mendelian genetics ideas. However, there is an exception to that case where they don't follow those same ratios at all. Um, at the most basic or first glance. And those are genes that are associated with the sex chromosomes, either X or Y. The sex-linked genes are going to be controlled specifically by, or they're going to be located on the sex chromosomes, so they are going to be inherited as those sex chromosomes are inherited, um, which means that they're gonna have different allelic forms. Uh, those allelic forms are gonna have different chance of getting inherited if it's a boy versus a girl or in the gametes at the beginning of the day. So the recessive sex link traits are more common than dominant simply because if it is an X linked gene, you are going to have to have two copies of it in order for it to show properly. And um, if you have that one copy on Y in you know males, are going to be more susceptible to these conditions because, again, when you have X-linked genes um, that are the cause of the problem, you just need that one copy. And now it's a recessive allele. That's the only allele that's present because in a boy or in males, you're only going to have one X chromosome and the other one's going to be a Y chromosome. In females, you will have more chance of having carriers of alleles um, that are that can cause that particular trait. X-linked traits um, are carried on the X chromosomes and are obviously going to make up majority of the X-linked inherited, or uh, majority of the sex-linked inherited, because Y chromosome is only seen when you get a male phenotype and 50% of the gametes won't even have that um, in the best case scenario. So the Y-linked traits alleles uh, that are found on the Y chromosomes usually link um, any mutations that happen in them or any abnormalities that happen in them usually end up leading to sterility of the male that has those mutations. So they end up not getting inherited. But X chromosome or X-linked alleles are much easier to be passed around because they're going to be present both in males and females, and because females can be carrier of this uh, process and pass it on to their progeny, their girls and boys, their uh, males and females. So here is an example of what that would be looking like. So in this case, um, this is a white gene, Intrasophila melanogaster, which will only show up in uh, if it is, uh, it is a recessive allele, so it will only show up when it is the only allele present. Uh, it is an X-linked allele, so it is going to be present on the X chromosome or equivalent of the X chromosome. So in this case, 
your females can be either a uh, wild type. They can get a normal copy from the mom and a normal copy from the dad and be just completely normal. They can be heterozygous and be a carrier where they have one mutated copy from the mom or dad and one copy from uh, the other parent that is wild type, or they can be completely um, a recessive homozygous if both the mom who would have to be a carrier and the dad who would have to be white eyed cross together and end up giving both abnormal copies of the allele or white copies of the allele. On the other hand, for the Y chromosomes or the males, you would have 50% chance that you would get a white eyed uh, male compared to um, a wild type male because half of the males are going to get the wild type allele and half of them are going to get the white eyed allele so half of your progeny is going to be that for um, the females it's going to be equal probability it's going to be two to one probability of getting a white eyed male phenotypically um, because two are going to be phenotypically wild type and one of them is going to be only one out of three is going to be phenotypically white eyed female however the heterozygous female is going to be a carrier for that and can pass it on to her progeny and her boys can uh, 50 percent of her male progeny can be white eyed uh, another excellent trait is uh, color blindness, in uh, which can also be again inherited uh, the same way. So here is an example with that Punnett square, where you have a female that is a carrier, a mom that's a carrier, and a male that is normal, uh, can normal vision. Both have normal vision phenotypically, but one of the female is a carrier and the male is uh, just. Um, wild type normal vision uh, the females out of the two females one female would be uh, if uh, would be completely fine wild type and one of them is gonna be a carrier for the blind uh, color blind allele on the other hand in the males one male uh, would be out of the males uh, 50 percent would have You'd have 50% chance of having a normal vision male and 50% chance of having a colorblind male. So uh, females, you'd have 0% chance of getting a wild, uh, getting a colorblind female from this cross because the male provides the wild type completely fine vision allele to its his daughters uh, and only half of the gametes from the carrier female is going to be colorblind so none of the daughters would ever show the color blindness in them from this cross but half of the males uh, 50 percent of the males would have the chance to have color blind Finally, um, let's look at some other ways that sex determination plays a part in this process so, you know, if you have a simple sex link trait with an XY system, that will work very similar to how we just showed, but that's not the only way sex determination happens in animals. You actually have different ways that uh, sex determination can happen for different species. Um, and in some cases, some species can actually change that system as well based on environment and other mechanism, the temperature they're at, the interactions they're having. So those can also make a difference in um, what sex choice mechanism is used uh, in that particular organism. So there are three main systems that you will uh, see in uh, addition to the typical X and Y system. One is the XO system that's typically seen in some uh, insects. And this includes a female, which is XX, and a male that's just a simple 1X. So the male just does not have 
the uh, it doesn't have a y chromosome it doesn't have anything other than a single x in this case we also have zw system used by so many birds um, where the females are zw so they have two different alleles um, two different versions versus a male is just both copies are z uh, z and this is kind of the opposite of what we see in humans, right? For example, where we have the XY system and females are XX and males are XY. And these uh, organisms or in these animals, you have CW as female. <coughs> and ZZ as males. And finally, um, some insects such as bees uh, will and ants will have a haplodiploid system where females are diploid but males are only haploid um, and that is important in the way they carry out their system so males arise from gametes that are not fertilized um, and uh, females are the only ones where they have actual uh, fertilized eggs that lead to the production of female progeny. So uh, these are sometimes dictated by an organism's hormonal or cell autonomous mechanisms to control when which system is going to be in, uh, used uh, for certain parts, certain organisms, but in most cases, obviously, um, these are concrete. So what happens when you have different alleles present at different rates, especially when you have alleles that are present on sex chromosomes? How do you make sure that every individual is having these alleles produced at just the right dosage to do the work that they need to do? So depending on what organism you're looking at, whether it's mammals with their XY system or you have worms and other, uh, you know, as the elegans, for example, with their XX versus XO system, or uh, flies and bugs with their system of XY versus XX, um, you have to have the right dosage compensation when there are two uh, copies of that allele present in one organism versus a single copy in the second sex, so in females versus males. In most cases, it's the males that have less of that product compared to the females that have two copies of those alleles. Um, so your autosomal expression will always be the same because all autosomal chromosomes will have same two copies in there. But in X chromosome, Sometimes in some um, organisms like in D. melanogaster, so these are Drosophila or fruit flies, the males will produce, will have upregulation of certain genes on the X chromosome to do, uh, compensate for the having just a single copy of the X chromosome. And the females will have just their normal expression level that needs to be there to do the work they need to do. Similarly, in mammals, um, they also have dosage compensation to maintain a particular amount of expression for the X-linked genes. In this case, however, instead of upregulating in the males, both males and females produce the same amount on uh, one chromosome. The second chromosome um, in each one of our cells as females is randomly chosen which one it is going to do it's just shut down through methylation and through post-translational you know through epigenetic changes so that it is completely inactivated and that leads to what we call a bar body that is actually visible in our cells but that x chromosome that is inactivated then does not contribute to the uh, stuff that is being produced by the other x and the levels can be maintained at the correct level. The another thing that can happen is partial inactivation or partial down regulation of both X chromosomes. That happens in hermaphrodites or C elegans, 
where um, both chromosomes are functional, both chromosomes are producing product at each allele, but they're producing it at half the dose of a male uh, to make sure that all of them are kept at a constant level. So, um, okay. So, just to kind of go over a little bit of um, how sex determination happens in individuals. Obviously, um, the way you would get those is going to be depending on the alleles that you're getting or the chromosomes that you're inheriting. Uh, but some of these things are also dependent upon some uh, different changes that can happen to the organism as well. So a gonadotromorph is an organism that is made up of both males and female genotypes and can display both in the, uh, both characteristics, display characteristics of both males and females because of the genotypes uh, that they have inherited. So they could have um, both alleles present, both X and Y chromosomes present, or uh, they could have cells that have uh, X chromosomes uh, and cells that have Y chromosome activated within them because two zygotes may be combined together and fused at a very early stage. Um, you all can also have an organism that is mosaic um, and that's many times seen with the uh, fur colors or coat colors in animals uh, where or in these butterflies, for example, where you have the same zygote that was there, but part of the uh, organism has one set of genome while other parts have different ones. How could that happen? One example of that would be through that um, accent activation that happens where randomly one of the X chromosome is inactivated in each one of the cells, leading to some parts of your uh, organism having one set of genome while the other one is inactivated and other parts of your organism having a different phenotype related to the different alleles that are present. But in this case, the important part is that all of them would be coming from the same zygote, so they will all be genetically female or male, whatever that particular uh, zygote was, that fertilized egg was. A chimera, on the other hand, is different in mosaic in that in this case, the single organism is composed of both males and female maybe, or maybe they are both females, but they are derived from different zygotes. And so it is clearly visible when they are coming from uh, different sexes. Right, so it is um, a single organism that has different population of different genetic background or genetically distinct cells within it because they're derived from different zygotes that are fused together at a very early stage. An example of that would be in this bird where half of it is showing up female while the other half is showing a male. Here is another example where in the face you can see a very clear distinction on which part of this particular cat is showing an orange versus the black fur color um, and different color eyes as well. This plant, again, because of the way the zygotes have fused, they have very different colors in those two parts. Um, so X chromosome inactivation, which is very specific to mammals, happens when you have in an early embryo, in this case, the X chromosome, this happens specifically in females, so this would be specific to a female uh, cat, you have the two copies of X chromosomes, one from your mom and one from your dad. One may have an uh, one variant of the allele, in this case the orange fur, while the second one has the allele for black fur instead. Uh, when the cells start to divide, as they divide, one X is made inactive in each one of those cells, and it is done at a random way, so that some cells are only going to produce orange fur, while others are only going to produce black fur, leading to this cat that has that kind of modeled both orange and black fur um, in different portions of its body. 
So if we have a new allele that we're or a new trait that we're working with and we want to know whether it is sex linked or not, we can do that in a similar fashion as to how we did a test cross earlier to figure out dominant versus recessive. In this case, we need to design two separate sets of crosses where um, all of our parental organisms have to be true breeding uh, to begin with, to work with, so that we can examine them in an appropriate manner. So in this case, our first parental cross is going to be made of uh, true breeding wild type individuals for the trait that we're examining crossed with a true breeding recessive fly, which is typically this, you know, uh, shown here as the white eyed fly, uh, male fly. And you're going to look at your first filial generation. Uh, and you are going to look at the progeny once they are crossed in that second parental generation and examine what you get uh, in the second filial generation. So in the first filial generation, you're going to end up with, in this case, a heterozygous uh, female and a male that has the allele as well. Uh, now, if it is a X-linked allele, you will see that all of your males in that uh, population are going to show that particular phenotype and are going to end up showing that uh, different, that uh, wild type phenotype that you were examining. And all your females aren't going to be heterozygous at this point. When you cross the, the second uh, cross by combining them together, um, you are going to, in your second filial generation, end up with females that are all exam uh, looking the same, but half of them are going to be carriers and half of them uh, would be wild type, while your males are also going to show 50-50 effect as well, where half of your males are going to have wild type eyes while the remaining are going to be um, showing the recessive phenotype. In the second cross, you are going to be examining uh, a female that is expressing the trait of interest, in this case, the white eyes, and you're going to be crossing it with a male that does not express the trait. So in the first cross, you are examining the male has the trait that you're interested in and the female is just wild type. And in the second one, you're doing it the reverse. So the males are not showing the trait. They are the wild type while the female has the trait that you're interested in. And in this case, in the case of an X-linked or a sex-linked gene, you're going to get your females to be carriers uh, in the first filial generation while all uh, of your males are going to show the interest, um, the trait of interest. And when you cross them together, you would expect your half your females to have the trait and the remaining half <coughs> to be carriers, but showing file type phenotypically. And same ratio with the males as well. So this would give you an idea of whether your alleles, uh, your genes are sex linked or not. Um, so this uh, is basically examining whether you have a sex linked uh, allele or not. So uh, finally, another exception to our uh, Mendelian inheritance is uh, when your phenotypes may not exactly match up with your genotypes as expected. This can happen when your phenotypes have different uh, penetrants based on what other genes are present, what other alleles are present. Um, 
and also how much of them are getting expressed at a given time. So penetrance is basically just the proportion of individuals in a population, and we usually look at it as a percentage that have that particular genotype in that population, and thus show the corresponding final uh, phenotype. So a complete penetrance would be where every single individual in that population or majority of the individuals in that population are showing the mutant phenotype, while the incomplete penetrance would be where only a small percentage of the population is showing the mutant phenotype. And in these cases, the mutant phenotype is just in one flavor, one variant. So it is just, you know, maybe presence or absence of a particular disorder or presence or absence of a particular pigment. There is no in-between uh, of that. On the other end, you have expressivity, which is the variability in the way that mutant phenotype shows up. So in the case of that red or white flower, where when it combined together, it was giving a pink phenotype, you could have range of mutant phenotypes where some individuals may show it in a very, very prominent manner, while others may show just a small uh, variability or small, uh, smaller range of response in response to those mutants. So you can have some individuals that are uh, showing the full mutant phenotype, while others are just showing some of the symptoms and not all of the symptoms. Autism, an example of that, where it is has a broad expressivity, so you can have a whole range of phenotypes associated with it, not just a single one. Um, so this would be an example of complete penetrance where every single individual is showing some form of that uh, mutant phenotype, but they are showing it at a variable level uh, with incomplete penetrance, only some of the individuals would show it and they will show it at variable levels. So you would only have a very small percentage of population that show the full-blown mutant phenotype at any given time. These happen because of a variety of reasons. Some of this is because of the parental environment and we will see examples of that where the environment that the parent grew up in, that the parent was exposed to, can directly affect the progeny that it has, both while they are, you know, so this is not just environment while they are carrying their young, but also um, any time in their life. And that can be associated with how the offsprings are um, affected by that as a result. It could also be due to inherited genetic variations, so that small mutations and small changes in the variants of those alleles can lead to differences in the way that it shows up in the final individual. You could just be associated with changes in the general environment of the individual, so that people in different environments um, or individuals in living in slightly different environments can show different response um, to the same variants, different expressivity of the same variants. It can also be through to non-inherited parental genetic variation, which are basically variations in those alleles as they're crossing over, as they're replicating, and those can play a role in your final response as well. So a lot of it is controlled by both the parental parents' internal as well as external environment, as well as inherited genetic variations. So the phenotypic ratios um, may not be, as we said, may not be as expected, uh, and that can occur due to many different reasons. We are gonna be looking at a few of these reasons in later lectures, um, and one of them, is going to be, uh, some of them are going to be associated with how certain mutations, when they are present, are just lethal. They, those organisms can just not survive if they are going to be present at that, uh, if that mutation is present and they're unable to perform that function or the way that it alters the normal biochemical processes present in our body. 
and that lethality will shift the phenotypic ratios because they will never be observed since they die off before they're ever observed. It could also be because of sampling error if you are in a population with a, a very little uh, penetrance of a particular phenotype. For example, you may miss a particular version of that phenotype because it's never seen in your sampling if you sample a small enough, you know, if you don't sample wide enough region or population. And finally, it could be due to linkage, which is when multiple alleles, uh, not multiple alleles, multiple genes, I'm sorry, multiple genes work um, together in some way and are somehow linked to each other because of their proximity or because of their function, uh, either, you know, like physical proximity or functional proximity in a biochemical pathway. And that can lead to the downstream effect uh, changing these phenotypic ratio. And so these things can be examined and found through a chi test, or uh, which examines or chi square test, which is a statistical procedure to examine whether or not we are seeing a deviation between observed versus expected ratios based on Mendelian principles. And so um, that would be something that we will learn how to work with and work through depending upon what it is that we are observing as we start to move into uh, multiple genes, examining multiple genes at the same time and how they're inherited as well. So in summary, today we talked about diploid organisms where there are two different alleles at a single locus and how they would segregate equally between gametes during meiosis. We examined how uh, that would affect the phenotypes depending upon those alleles that were segregating. Uh, we examined, um, we reviewed how to decide whether an allele is dominant versus recessive in a particular gene locus. Um, and we talked about how classical genetics use true breeding line lines, monohybrid crosses, Punnett squares, test crosses, and reciprocal crosses to figure out if their genes are sex linked or if they have just normal autosomal inheritance patterns. Um, we also talked about how sex linked genes are exception to standard Mendelian inheritance and how their phenotypes are inf uh, influenced not just by the gene uh, locus that they're examining, but whether uh, what type of sex uh, chromosome system they're working in and whether they are associated with a dosage compensation or not. And then finally, we talked about how male female phenotype can be determined by chromosomes or individual genes or the environment and how it can change in certain environments as well. So next time, we are going to go into mutations and phenotypes a little bit more before going into a ana genetic analysis of multiple genes um, and dihybrid crosses. So see you next time.